Amen. Why is God so present a commander in our time of prosperity and so very absent in our time of trouble? I'm not the person who originally said that. That is a quote from C.S. Lewis. Anybody ever read C.S. Lewis before? Chronicles of Narnia, famous author. He wrote that in the aftermath of a tragic loss. He uh, married late in life at the age of 57. Didn't expect that he would fall in love, but he fell magically in love. And within four years of marrying this woman, cancer took her away. And he wrote about that experience later and how absent and how silent he felt like God was in the aftermath of that loss. Have you ever been there before? Like maybe not that exact same loss, but have you ever suffered in such a traumatic way that you cried out to God asking, where were you when that happened? And where are you now, now that it's happened, and you felt like heaven had slammed its doors on you? Have you ever felt that way? Or maybe it's different for you. Maybe it's you right now. You're not going through a tragic loss. You're not just in the aftermath of something, or you're not just really going through it, but you have this sort of ongoing frustration, like this splinter in your hand that you can't see, but you know it's there, and it's aggravating. Maybe it's, it's a toxic work environment. Maybe you're raising toddlers, and you just want to pull your hair out because you don't know what you're doing, and there's no like perfect guidebook for how to do it. Or maybe you look forward your whole life to retirement because finally you could take a deep breath and then you're busier than you've ever been in retirement. Anybody relate to that? I'm talking about the everyday frustrations of life, and sometimes it can just as much make you want to pull your hair out, the everyday frustrations, as it does the tragic losses. It's like the difference between a flood and a steady dripping. And so you start to feel like God isn't there, like he's not speaking, and you're calling upon him, and he's not responding, and he's not answering. And I can tell you this from my own experience, is if you camp out in that place for a while, and you start to feel this sense like God's not there, and you, and you kind of, uh, you, the emotion that starts to creep in is the emotion of fear. Because you start to think in your head, is this going to change? Is this situation going to be healed? Am I going to be delivered from it? Whatever it is. And you start to become afraid, and this fear becomes this snowball that builds and builds and builds and builds to the point where even when God answers your prayer, even if he was to stand right in front of your face, you wouldn't acknowledge it, you wouldn't even see it, because you've been telling yourself for so long in fear, God's not here, he's not doing anything. Has anyone ever been there before? And so we're going to look this morning at a story in the life of the Apostle Paul where Jesus comes to him and interrupts his story at a critical moment when he has been on the run. Things have not been going his way. He was on the run from a city in Philippi, then he was on the run from another city, Thessalonica, then on the run from Berea, and each of these situations face to face with his own potential death and the loss of everything, escaping tragedy narrowly, and then he shows up, and this was last week we talked about it, he shows up in the city of Athens, and for the first time he's not chased out of the city, but he kind of leaves the city unsuccessfully. We read his sermon last week. It's maybe one of the most masterful sermons ever preached, and the philosophers of Athens yawned through it. There was no church plant in Athens. There was no revival in Athens. It was an everyday frustration, the frustration of failure. And so you have going from tragedy or potential tragedy to tragedy or potential tragedy and running and running and running, and then you have the frustration of failure, and Paul shows up in Corinth, and Corinth, that's the city we're going to talk about today, Corinth, this was, this was Las Vegas of the ancient world. This was Sin City. 
it was said, like there's actually a saying, like that person lives like a Corinthian. This is like that what it meant was you waste your life away on immorality. There was the goddess Aphrodite who was there and her thousand cult prostitutes, and it was just gross immorality, a hard city. And so Paul's been going from one city to the next. What's going to happen here? Right in like, like the devil's throne room, right here in the midst of Sin City, what are we going to do? And where is God? How do you find God in the midst of tragedy and in the midst of everyday frustration? How do you find him in the midst of your tragedy, your disappointment and heartbreak and frustration? We're going to see how God meets the Apostle Paul and how he meets us in our everyday life and pain and frustration. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 18 this morning. You can turn your Bibles there if you have one. And if you don't, that's all right. We have the words up on the screen. Acts chapter 18 the Apostle Paul in Corinth. We're going to read verses 1 through 17. So let's begin in verse 1. It says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. That was the emperor. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So he's got a day job, he's a tent maker, and on the weekends he's preaching. Verse 5, his partners who he left behind at the church in Philippi. Verse 5, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed him and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there, and he went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. So a mob and a riot is starting, and right next door to the synagogue is Paul's number one potential convert. It says, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking. And do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. That is, many people who are going to come to know me through your ministry. Verse 11, and he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achia, that's the region of Corinth, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names in your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Galileo paid no attention to these things. Now that's an interesting turn of events. The Jews just sought to have Paul persecuted, and the outcome was, what, was that the Jews were persecuted. The harm they sought was the harm they got, and Jesus' promise to Paul is fulfilled. He said, I'm go- I am with you, Paul. I'm here to protect you. And Paul, who's so used to having to defend himself, Paul, who's run from city to city, escaping with his own feet, is about to open his mouth to defend himself, but before he can even speak up for himself to be his own defender, God moves the heart of a pagan political ruler and speaks up to protect the Apostle Paul in fulfillment of the promise of Jesus. I love that. It's like the scripture says. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. He guides it like a watercourse wherever he pleases. 
and God touches the heart of that pagan ruler to protect his servant Paul in fulfillment of his promise. Now, that's a bit of a turn of events, wouldn't you say? Let me ask you a question. When Jesus appears to Paul, it says Jesus came to him in a vision. And I wish I had time to talk about the importance of learning to hear God through dreams and visions, because if we don't have that, if Paul doesn't have that, he doesn't get this incredible experience. But Jesus appears to him in a vision in the night, and he says, fear not. Now, let me ask you, why do you think he's saying that? It's a real simple question, because he was afraid. I think sometimes we whitewash our biblical heroes of, like, they don't feel confusion and they don't feel afraid. No, 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 no. Jesus came and appeared to Paul and said, don't be afraid, because Paul was afraid. Yes, even the apostle Paul gets afraid. He's human, too. And why is he afraid? He's afraid because there's been a pattern in his life. And the pattern has gone something like this. Paul preaches... Jews get angry, Jews incite violence, Paul runs for his life. Paul preaches, Jews get angry, Jews incite violence, Paul runs for his life. So now he's watching this pattern play out in Corinth, and he's three links into the four-link chain. And he's thinking, I know how this one goes. Like, I know which domino is next. And he's got to be thinking, like, you know, I don't have nine lives. How long is this going to go? I've already been beat into a bloody pulp once in Philippi. I kind of don't want to get beat again. And so Paul is terrified, and he's terrified because he's seen the way this pattern has worked out in his life. And this shows us something in Paul's life. It also shows us something about our own lives, about the nature of fear and the way your brain processes fear, which is this. Fear is pattern-based. Fear is pattern-based. The central thing Jesus says, he says, fear not and go on preaching. But it starts with that fear not. But But fear in your life, whatever it is that you're afraid of, you're not afraid of it for like zero reason. There is a pattern that's been established in your life at some point through some experience that you've had. So it's a little bit like, like this. So, uh, you know, I'm the, I'm the cheap guy that doesn't want to pay the lawnscape guy to come out and do my bushes. So I was like planting bushes and I don't know what I'm doing and like, the holes are all like messed up and everything. But I was planting these different shrubs in my yard and I'm deep into the yard work and, I'm, and I see there's like this kind of branch in the way and I reach over to move the branch out of the way so I can put a bush there. But the branch moves for me. In fact, it slithers. I almost reached out and picked up a snake by the tail. And you can imagine my reaction. I was afraid, and my heart started to beat really fast. And so I called Julie Holder, and she took care of it. No, just kidding. Just kidding. (laughs) See, this was a a multiple, this was like a three-week yard project. It was like a huge project. And so like the next day and the next day and the next day, every time I'm in the yard, every time I see a stick, what do you think my brain tells me? (laughs) It's a snake. And so like, I'm just like terrified in my flower bed. My neighbors are like, probably what is wrong with that guy? Because I'm like jumping back like all the time. And and so what you you see what I'm saying here, fear is pattern based. And if it's a particular, particularly traumatic experience. It only takes one of those experiences to build this pattern in your mind. And I think what's happening with some of us in a passage about, about fear, and when we in our humanity deal so deeply with fear, I think what's happening to some of us is we're seeing sticks that our mind is registering as snakes because of the way something happened before in our lives. And for some of us, it goes back to childhood, and you grew up in a childhood where you never had enough money, and never had enough money, and never had money, and and as it turns out, you actually didn't starve to death, but your parents always talked about how you never had enough money, and now, like, you can't afford a jet ski, and you're like, I'm dead broke, and you start to get fear, and see what you're, what is happening is you're seeing a stick that your mind is registering as a snake, 
or maybe you grew up in a family where there was addiction present, or maybe you grew up in a family where your parents were neglectful and your mind has registered that where suddenly, you know, your spouse just has something like mildly corrective for you and you're like, what, you're rejecting me? Or your boss, you're firing me? And so you start to go through these experiences registering sticks as snakes that aren't even snakes at all because fear is pattern-based. And what Jesus does is he comes into the pattern and he breaks it because fear is pattern-based, but God is a pattern breaker. He doesn't have to keep to that pattern. And you guys should know this because you live in Texas, and it can be 70 degrees and sunny one day, and the very next day your pool can have a thin sheet of ice. (laughs) God doesn't have to keep to the pattern, does he? Think about your own story. Has it turned out the way you expected it to be? God is the author of our stories, never does it the way we expect. He's unpredictable in the way he does things. And when you're stuck in that rut of fear and you're saying, I was rejected before, so I'll be rejected again. I failed before, so I'm going to fail again. And your mind is going into these dark places and that fear snowball is developing. And you're telling yourself, God isn't here. God isn't here. God isn't here. He is here, but you're just focused on the stick. And he's coming in, and he wants to break that pattern. He wants to break you out of that rut and routine into a living and vibrant and active experience of him so you can live in that holy zone of fear not, for I'm with you. So fear is pattern-based, but God is not. He is a pattern breaker. He's unpredictable. And if you're here this morning and you're stuck in that fear pattern, and you're stuck in a rut, this is encouragement to you because God wants to break you out of that. And just because your yesterday was bad doesn't mean your tomorrow has to be bad. There's a temptation sometimes as a a pastor to promise things that go beyond what the Bible promises. And to tell you all that because God is a a pattern breaker, he's going to turn your wilderness into a promised land flowing with milk and honey where there's just no pain anymore. You know, the Apostle Paul talks about those kind of preachers, and he says, uh, he says, in the last days, preachers will come and they'll tickle people's ears with truths they want to hear. I wish I could promise you that the future God has for you is a pain-free future but I can't promise you that. I can tell you that he'll bring you out of this rut and that he wants to interrupt that pattern and he wants to take you out of this fear and he does turn wildernesses into promised lands, but even in the promised land, there's pain. I mean, have you read the story of Israel and kind of what it was like there? (laughs) It's a land flowing with milk and honey, but there really is still pain there. And to bring it back to our passage today is I was honestly, this week, kind of wrestling with it, because I was just having this conversation with the Lord, and I said, and I was just like, Lord, I mean, your unpredictability, while encouraging in some ways, almost discourages in other ways, and sometimes it discourages me because I don't know what you're going to do, like I I wish I could just count on you to give me the pain-free life that I want, but you don't promise that. What I want to show you is he promises something better. And as we look in this story, in the the Apostle Paul's life, and as he interacts with some more people, we're going to see a truth emerge. I want to point this truth out to you, and it's this. Sometimes God achieves his purpose by protecting us from pain, but sometimes he achieves his purpose by allowing it. Sometimes God achieves his purpose by protecting us from pain, But sometimes he achieves his purpose by allowing it. So let me show that from the passage we just read. So God protects Paul in Corinth. Remember, he opens the mouth of the pagan politician to be Paul's defender. So Paul doesn't even have to defend himself. And we can see God's plan in this. We can see what he is accomplishing in this. 
Corinth is going to be the first city that Paul can stay long term. We just read he stayed there a year and a half. And doesn't it make sense that in Las Vegas, that in Sin City, God would put his number one apostle there to work and to build relationship and to develop the gospel's influence in this city. So because God protects the Apostle Paul in Corinth, he's able to establish a church in the middle of Sin City. It's easy to see how God's protection served a purpose there. But now I want to show you how on another occasion, God not protecting Paul, God allowing Paul to experience pain, serves his purpose also. I mentioned earlier in Philippi, Paul's beaten with rods. He's laying on the ground in a puddle of his own blood. They take him away to a prison. They put his feet in stocks. We read about this a few weeks ago. It's Acts chapter 16. Had, had God not allowed Paul to go through this, however, you know what wouldn't have happened? Paul wouldn't have had the opportunity to preach the gospel to the people who were there in the prison. He wouldn't have had the opportunity to lead the, do you remember this guy, the suicidal prison ward to the Lord? And if he hadn't led that guy to the Lord, then he wouldn't have been able to lead his family. And, and for them, it was like a whole relational network, call it 20 people to the Lord. He said his whole household was baptized. And that became one of the important foundation pieces to the church in Philippi. Maybe the church in Philippi would have never been established. Maybe we would have never had a New Testament book called Philippians, which is Paul's letter to the church in Philippi that he planted on that occasion. So do you see how the tragedy of being unjustly beaten actually led to eternal life change for lots of people? I mean, that's a pretty profound difference in the way God used pain in Paul's life. And in fact, had God not allowed Paul to be chased out of Philippi, there wouldn't have been an opportunity to go to Berea and Thessalonica and then Athens and on down the line where these different gospel influences were established. And then Corinth, it's actually part of what brought Paul here to fulfill his purpose. And so you see that sometimes God achieves his purpose by, uh, by preventing us from going through pain and sometimes by allowing us to go through pain. And it wasn't just Paul in this story either. It was also a couple. Do you remember this couple, Priscilla and Aquila? We, we read about them a minute ago. First of all, I just love this. A married couple. They're not like, it's not like Apostle Priscilla and Aquila. This is just a married couple that loves the Lord. No title, never preached a sermon, but this is an absolutely pivotal partnership for the Apostle Paul. And they do some really special things. We read in some of the other New Testament letters some of the things that they do. They host a church in their home in Ephesus. They host a church in their home in Rome. Later in this story, in Acts chapter 18, they make a disciple out of a guy named, a guy named Apollos who goes to Corinth and becomes Corinth's pastor. And so you have these people who have this incredible influence. And then in Romans chapter 16, Paul's writing a letter to the Romans. And he says, I want you to greet these two people, Aquila and Priscilla, because they risked their neck to save my life. Now that's like literally risked their neck. They would have been, you know, beheaded if they got caught. And so you see this couple that did some tremendous things, but it was very subtle. How did they get to Corinth? Was Corinth just their hometown? They just lived in Sin City, liked to gamble? Why were they there? They were there because there was an emperor named Claudius who said, Jews, you can't live in Rome anymore. Get out. Let me just pause and think about that for a moment. Pause and just imagine, like, what if a president stood up and said, black people, get out of America or white people, or Mexicans, or whatever you want to call it. Like, this would be a tragedy, okay? And this is, this is an ethnic deportation. And just imagine, their roots are in Rome. Their business is in Rome. Their friends are in Rome. Their family is in Rome. They put down their roots in Rome. And the emperor's like, oh, you're Jewish? Get out. And he kicks them out of the town. And then in the scripture there, in verse 2, it says they only recently arrived from Corinth 
further emphasizing that theme throughout this passage of God's writing of our story, of his divine providence and overseeing of all affairs. And so you have Paul arriving because of tragedy. You have Priscilla and Aquila arriving because of tragedy. You have God sometimes achieving his purpose by allowing our pain, sometimes by protecting us from pain, and you see the way both of these work together. I think sometimes in our lives, and this happens to me, we become experts at looking for the hand of God, but we need to learn to look for the fingerprints of God. The hand of God is like, I'm going to be rescued, I'm going to be delivered, I want to see the miracle, I want to see God come through. Like, you really don't even need faith for that. Like, that's just like God came through and took care of biz. What you really need faith for is to see the fingerprints of God in the way, even in the midst of your heartbreak, your disappointment, your tragedy, your pain, and your frustration, God, behind the scenes, is organizing and orchestrating and using those things to achieve something that is wonderful for you and for his glory. I just think of my son, uh, William, who I'm just trying to get to ride his bike. He should be able to ride it by now, but I'm working with him to ride his bike, and I, and I hold the back of a seat like this, and he's like, Dad, you're not holding on. I'm like, yes, I'm totally holding on, and he doesn't know it. And I think we're like, God, you're so absent, and there he is holding on to the back of the seat. Because we're looking for this massive display of fireworks show of God's intervention, and his hand is just there all along. Now, this is true not just in the case of tragedy, but also everyday life frustrations. Paul's in Corinth not just because he keeps getting kicked out of town but, and, and he meets Priscilla and Aquila, not just because, you know, he's on the run, but for another reason, too. Did you also catch in verse 2 what Paul's occupation was? He was a tent maker. I mean, just think about this. I mean, this, this is my mind working. What a waste. Like, we're talking about, this is the apostle Paul. This guy is so well-read. I mean, people like one king and later in the scripture will read about it. He's like, Paul, your great learning has driven you mad. Like, this is a guy who reads, like, centuries-old poets for fun. This guy is a scholar among scholars, a missionary among missionaries, a preacher of the gospel like no other. Making tents all week long. I mean, what a waste. God, put him to work. Why is he making tents? Well, his buddies, Silas and Timothy, his disciples, they're back taking care of the church in Macedonia, and you kind of don't really pick this up. It's not until verse 5, until Timothy and Silas show up, that Paul becomes full-time gospel preacher once again. We see later why. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 11, the apostle Paul talks about it. They came with an offering freeing Paul up so the Macedonian church supports Paul financially so that he can go into full-time gospel ministry. So here's the, here is the reason Paul's a tent maker. He's short on cash. It's kind of one of those everyday life frustrations, isn't it? That doesn't make sense to us. But what if your cash shortage, <laughs> what if your everyday life frustration what if your unanswered prayer is God depriving you of something you'd like to have because he's giving you something you need far more? God was giving Paul ministry partners, Priscilla and Aquila, whom he would have never met had it not been for something as simple as a cash shortage and something as profoundly horrible as an eth ethnic deportation. And God weaves together the tragedies and the everyday frustrations. And let me be clear, God's heart and God's plan from the very beginning, he actually had a heart for a pain-free world. God does not delight in your pain, but he's also not limited by your pain. He uses it. Now that we've introduced sin and pain into this world, he will use even that, even your sin, for his glory and your good. And that's how powerful he is. And he will weave it into a story. And let me just pause for a moment here and reflect back on this story and show the fingerprint of God throughout it. Had 
Priscilla and Aquila, or had God intervened and prevented the deplorable ethnic deportation in Rome, and had God intervened and prevented Paul from getting kicked out of these cities, and had God just done something as simple as brought the offering a little bit sooner, if God had done all of these things, this incredible partnership would have never happened. The churches in Corinth, Ephesus, and Rome would have struggled, and Paul might have lost his life sooner because Priscilla and Aquila wouldn't have been there to protect him, which means that all those churches across the Mediterranean that turned the world upside down for the gospel wouldn't have been planted, and the New Testament would have been a lot shorter. (laughs) Do you see how God weaves it all in? You can't see how he's weaving it all in in your life right now, but he is. The fingerprints are there. He's using the pain, the struggle, the frustration, the tragedy. He's using it all to create something that will be ultimately beautiful. There's a pastor. His name is uh, Dr. James Emery White. He's a doctor because he's used to be a professor. At, at, well, he's still a professor. He used to be a president of a seminary, one I almost went to in Boston, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. Today, he's a pastor uh, of a church. What's the name of that church? Uh, Mecklenburg Community Church. It's 10,000 people. And something unique about this church is that for all of its size is that it, it didn't get to be this size by like poaching sheep from smaller congregations. Like, we've got cooler, hipper lights display or something. You know, come over here. It wasn't like that. 70% of the people in his church actually came from a background of no church. Well, uh, here's his story. I'm just going to call him James for simplicity's sake. Um, He tells a story like this. He was 19 years old, didn't know the Lord. He was a university student. And some of his friends were going to be traveling to one of the, uh, it's a little bit of a road trip, a neighboring college to go and party with some of the students at that college for a weekend. And they said, hey, James, man, we've got, we've got a seat in the car for you. We've got four people going, got a five-seat car. There is space for you, buddy. Just come right along to this party. And he said, I really want to go, but I have an obligation. I, I can't, but I, I'll, I'll see if I can change it. And he goes back, and he he tries, he tries to move heaven and earth to shift this obligation. He doesn't tell us what the obligation was, probably work or something like that. But he, tries, he just does everything he can to try to shift it, and he absolutely can't. So he goes back and tells his friends, you guys are going to have to go without me. It's just not working. And so they go back, and, and so he goes back, he tells them that, and they, they go along on their party. Four, four people, road trip, college students, have a great time. That's Friday night. Saturday passes by, and Sunday passes by, and Sunday night, James hears the news of what happened, what happened just a few hours prior on Sunday afternoon. His friends had a great time at the party, and they're coming back, and probably, I'm sure, just talking about the different memories that they've just made, and everything is going wonderfully. They're driving down the highway, and car going the opposite way on the highway, veers off the road into the median, becomes airborne, begins to flip through the air, and lands directly head-on collision to the car of his friends. All four of them die immediately. And so he gets the news of that. Obviously, he can't sleep that night, so he goes out from his dorm to the football stadium, hops a fence, and goes up into the bleachers, says he sits under a moonlight sky, and he's confused. He doesn't know the Lord yet, but he's confused about God if you're out there kind of deal. Why does it seem like that some outside force made it impossible for me to occupy the fifth seat in that car? Like I did everything to be in that car. Why does it look like you protected me, but allowed that to happen to them? I want to read you his reflections on that moment. He's in the football stadium. Here's what he said. 
He says, I remember crying out to God to help me sort it all out, to make sense of it all, to talk to me, to say something, anything. Silence. In truth, it was one of the deepest conversations we had ever had. He was speaking to me, moving within me, communing and communicating with me on levels that had never been opened up to him before. It was the start of many conversations, some even more traumatic. Within four months, I became a Christian. Sometimes God's silence is actually part of the conversation. And when you think about your closest friendships, you don't have to occupy space with 24-7 words. And in some instances, that would be the wrong thing. Maybe you remember the story in the scripture of Job's friends. Job suffers tremendously, and his friends show up, and they just sit with him for seven days. The problem started when they started talking. But they sat with him for seven days, and their action, or their action of silence spoke louder than any word that they ever could have said. Sometimes God's silence in our situation is him inviting us into a deeper conversation because he's looking for something more than a superficial religion. He's looking for an intimate friendship which we, which we can share with him our deepest frustrations, our deepest pains, our pains that are even with him. He wants it all to come out. And I can say from my own experiences, when I've had those internal wrestling matches with God over his frustrating, seeming absence and silence, I've found some of those as being the most intimate moments with God. If you're going through a time of God's absence, God's silence, you're you're praying for something and it's just not happening, this is God drawing you in. He's drawing you deeper into a conversation with him. And the reason that we fear not is not because he makes every bit of pain go away. The reason we fear not is because his friendship is better than life. And that's what he's inviting us into. And the more you walk in a friendship with him, the more you learn to trust his heart that whether he allows the pain or whether he protects from the pain, either way, you learn to trust his heart just like you trust the heart of a friend. His intentions are good. I want to come back one more time to this promise because this is the defining statement of Paul to the church in, uh, or of Jesus uh, to Paul in the church in Corinth. Verses 9 and 10. I want to read it one more time. It says, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. What I want you to see here is what happens once we're able to step out of that realm of fear into that sort of holy zone of fear not. What happens? What happens for the Apostle Paul? What is this promise really about? It is about him being protected, but protected for what? I want you to see this. Jesus promises his presence not only for protection, but for partnership. Let me say that again. Jesus promises his presence not only for protection, but for partnership. He says, fear not, I'm going to protect you, and I have many people in the city, so keep on preaching. In other words, Paul, I've done my part to be with you and protect you. Now you do your part to continue opening your mouth for my sake. I think sometimes we want God's presence in our lives, but what we really want is warm fuzzies. What we really want is to be able to rub, raise our hand and worship and get a little goosebump. And I mean, that's cool. I like goosebumps too. But God wants something more than that. If you really want God's presence in your life, go where He is. And where is He? He's on mission. He has many people in this city. Are you joining Him and reaching them? One more little story, and this one comes back to C.S. Lewis, and it goes back. C.S. Lewis, he's gone now, but he was writing uh, during a period that included the space race. Anybody remember the space race? And a Russian cosmonaut came back, and, and he said, I went up into outer space and discovered that God is not there. 
It co comes from an atheist communist nation. Well, C.S. Lewis comments on it. And C.S. Lewis, what he said was this, was he says that if God exists, we shouldn't expect him to be empirically tested in outer space as though he's just another object in the universe. He says this would be like Hamlet going into the attic of his castle and expecting to find God there. Uh, or, sorry, I said God. Expect, <laughs> kind of ruined it. Expecting to find Shakespeare there. He said if Shakespeare, yeah, Shakespeare is the analogy of God in this story. He says if Hamlet is to find Shakespeare, the way it's going to happen is that Shakespeare is going to have to write himself into the story. And what's amazing to me about all of this is that's exactly what God did. God wrote himself into our story. The author of your story and all of human history wrote himself into it in the person of Jesus. We don't have to look into outer space. We look into history, and he came. And he came to be our Emmanuel. And if you ever doubt how much God wants to be with you, look to what he went through in order to be with you. And he included in his story something I don't think any of us would have ever included, a cross, torture. He doesn't necessarily explain perfectly in this life all the pain we go through, but one thing we know for sure is he suffered it himself, and he wrote it into his own story so that he could pay the penalty for our sin, for what stood between us and him, because from the very beginning, any absence of God or seeming absence of God is only there because of our sin. We pushed him away. It wasn't God pushing us away. And so Jesus came to deal with the barrier once and for all and to give his life for us on the cross and to invite us to join him on a life-giving mission. Let's pray.